Do you want to run Dungeons and Dragons and you don't want to write a game, but instead you just want to play a pre-written adventure and you're like, oh my god, there's so many, which one should I run? We're gonna tell you. <laughs> there's a lot of adventures for 5th edition and uh, luckily, we we have played most of them. If you haven't noticed, some of them are missing. We'll go over that. Um, there are two I haven't played. Uh, we're gonna be doing a ranking system of one through 10. They're not like, how well are they written? Because to be honest, all of them are written quite well. Um, they're, they're very detailed and they're very good and they have lots of really cool art. So what we're gonna be ranking them on is one being, ew, gross, uh, do not. We didn't enjoy it. We didn't enjoy it and uh, you maybe shouldn't buy it or play it at all. That's really long. And uh, 10 is uh, go buy it right now and play it for your friends immediately. Nike. Uh, <laughs> just do it. If you're brand new to the game and you are looking for an adventure to run or you're experienced and you're looking for a pre-written adventure to play for your group, uh, this video is for you because we'll go over all of that because I've run most of these for new people and for experienced people and I have things to say about all of them. So much to say, and in fact, I recorded this once already and it was 50 minutes long and we only got to about half. So uh, we're gonna be really, really short on these on these little reviews. Otherwise, this video is gonna be way too goddamn long. So expect quick, snappy reviews. In case you guys didn't know, uh, this is Spencer, my fiance. Hi. I get to marry this guy. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't you love uh, running the Dungeons of the Dragons? Um, it's very stressful. It's very stressful. Yep. Yeah, it can be very stressful. Um, there's a lot of things you got to write and oftentimes even the pre-written adventures don't always give you really good Neat little encounters that you can throw at your party um, Just for the ease and sake of the game, you know, I really wish I had a book like that Wait a second This video is sponsored by out of the box encounters by nerdarchy um, And if you're wondering Jacob that Kickstarter already finished. Oh, oh, I know I'm fully aware it finished because there's a late pledge backing option. Go check it out. There's a link in the description and in the comments. It is a awesome book filled with encounters that you can just kind of and right into your game. Uh, if your players are going to uh, a city and they're at a forest, you could be like, here's an encounter uh, written by really smart people. And uh, in fact, I am one of those smart people. So uh, go check it out, go back it, go get it, go support Nerdarchy. On to the video. All right, so we're gonna go in order here. Uh, let's freaking do this. Who, who made the order? The, the order was made by Wizards of the Coast when they released them in this order. All of the 5e pre-written adventures have these little tropes that I really don't like, and I'm gonna go over them right now. They're really stupid that they go to every freaking book, almost all of them. So uh, let's go over those real fast. Number one, uh, the, the tutorial mission. Uh, there's always this stupid mission that they put at the very beginning of almost all the pre-written adventures that's supposed to get you from like levels one to three and they typically never pertain to the adventure whatsoever. Some of these adventures pull it off really well by pertaining that adventure to the rest of the campaign. So I tend to call it the tutorial level because it's like, why did we do this? This was just to get us to level three, wasn't it? It was. The second one is uh, the thousands of NPCs that the game will just throw at the very beginning of the game. But some adventures do this thing where they even prompt the dungeon master and go turn to page 309 here's a list of 40 npcs give them to the players and it's like why that it's so first of all really really taxing on the dungeon master to just be like okay now i gotta manage like eight npcs two it is overwhelming for the players to be like here's like 80 characters being thrown at us why do we need to care about them whatsoever and uh three um why don't the characters just meet the npcs that they want to meet instead of just being them you know, them throwing at, you know, the players. So that's the other thing I really don't like, and I'll go over them and how to fix them in some of the adventures. And uh, number three, big awesome thing. Wow, ooh, look at that. Isn't that so cool? Basically, like, you know, in like a game where you're like playing, mm -hmm. and then like this epic thing happens, but you can't do anything about it. You can just look at it, and then like it goes, and it's gone. That happens in some of these adventures. The important thing about that one is the players can do nothing about it. It's just supposed to be there to serve plot and then leave. And it's like, I don't want to watch a movie. I want to play D&D. And you know, that's, you know, the players can't do anything about it. But anyways, let's get into this. All right. So number one is uh, Lost Minds of Fandelver. Uh, have you played this? I've played one game of it, yeah. I have ran it twice and played it once. Uh, this adventure is pretty good. It comes in the... 
Can you move your head? This one? Yeah. The starter set <laughs> for fifth edition. Um, so it comes with like a bunch of stuff. It comes with like dice and, and a bunch of other little things. It doesn't come as much as with the, with the newer That's one. That's my favorite thing about the starter set. Yeah. It comes with a set of dice. So uh, this adventure is definitely what you would think is your go-to for brand new players to D&D. I will agree for now. It is pretty good for brand new players. If you are looking to play D&D for like the first time and you want to have all the rules and you want to spend a bunch of money on it and you just want to pay 20 bucks and get the starter set, not not too bad, not too shabby. Personally, the essentials kit that came out recently is way better, but we'll get into that. The adventure is is all right. Um, what I don't like about it, well, what I, here, let's go over what I do like about it. What I do like about it is it's very, very, very simple. It has little side quests that you can uh, do throughout the game, and the little side quests uh, are are really interesting and like they're just very simple too. They just feel like like video game quests, and I really like that. So there's this chapter uh, later on um, called the Spider's Web where the players get a map and they get to travel and they get to get encounters and they get to go do side quests and this is one of my favorite parts of the game is because it's just open and the players can do whatever they want and the game really sets it up to be like oh wow look it's Davy Chappy it's Davy Chappy there he is that's him and one of my favorite parts about this is it's really easy for the dungeon master there are explanations for everything even the NPCs and there's flavor text for everything I love flavor text um, and it's one of my favorite parts about running a 5e uh, pre-written module the things I don't like about this game are the fact that uh, the beginning sucks a lot and it starts off with the players knowing a dwarf the dwarf getting captured getting taken to a goblin lair they have to defeat the goblin save the guy and then leave I think the adventure should start in Phandalin the players get to the town and they just have to find uh, out where their friend went and becomes like a mystery. I think mysteries are one of the best uh, like tropes for D&D to run. That one's me, that one's you. It's very accurate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, this one is definitely not bad, but not amazing. Um, it's good for what it's meant for, starting out for the new, like, new players. Yeah, I think there. Are, if if this is the first one you're watching and you're already bored, um, I think there are much better adventures for brand new players. Waterdeep Dragon Heist. So we'll get to those in a minute. Um, but this one, not bad, not good. Gonna give it a five. What do you give it? Um, a three. A three? <laughs> I don't really remember much from it. Um, There's just better adventures. Yeah. There's just better adventures. Um, if you want like a classic kill a... Is it kill a dragon? Do you have to kill a dragon? No, you have to kill a, wi a drow wizard guy. Oh, never mind. I and the, dra the dragon is like an NPC. Oh, Okay, That's so why Ice Spire Peak is better because yeah. you just kill a dragon. Like, that's freaking it's like awesome. Classic, like you go kill a dragon, you mm -hmm. do little quests, and that's what most people think about Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, num number number <laughs> two, Burger King <laughs> foot lettuce. Uh, number two, uh, Horde of the Dragon Queen. Um, mm -hmm. so how do we say this? Um, I, it's, did we play this? This is when you played a ranger. Oh fuck this game. <laughs> Um, so just to be simple about it, I personally just do not recommend this as an adventure whatsoever. It tends to be very show and tell. This adventure does the thing I was talking about earlier, the kind of like, oh, look at this cool thing, and the players can't do anything about it, and it starts at the very beginning because the adventure takes place at a fortress, and it's getting attacked by a dragon, and, uh, characters can't do jack diddly about it, but just be like, oh, well, that sucks, mm -hmm. and just have to deal with the chaos. Um, personally, I don't think this adventure gets really creative, um, either. What I love about a lot of the later adventures is that they just go weird and wacky with some of the stuff that D&D has to offer. And this one is just like, go here, kill guys, go here, learn things, go here, s save guy from Dragon Cult. And it's just Dragon Cult after Dragon Cult after Dragon Cult after a dragon. Um, if this adventure looked any, uh, any bit enticing to you, uh, don't really recommend it. We've played it before and nobody's really enjoyed it, so... Is this the game that I killed the kid in? Yep. Oh. Regardless, um, meh. Meh. What are we gonna give Horde of the Dragon Queen? Um, One? I, I don't really remember much about it besides hating playing it. All right, so but one out of 10. Definitely one out of 10. So um, number three would be uh, Rise, Rise of Tiamat. Um, apparently it's supposed to be better. I'm not gonna review it because I've never played it and I'm not gonna read it and pretend like I know what's going on because um, a lot of times per these adventures, everything sounds really great on paper, but it ends up not being very well when you execute it. Um, I think you can make Horde of the Dragon Queen fun with a really good dungeon master, but I mean, to be honest, you might as well just 
grab another adventure because a lot of them are just better. Mm -hmm. Also, same thing with Elemental Evil. Never played it. Um, don't plan on playing it. Don't really plan on reading it. The only cool thing about it is that there are um, some neat spells um, that you can add into your games. Um, they're like cool little elemental spells. Mm -hmm. So uh, along with a new race, um, which is like Genasi. It. Out of the Abyss. Uh, we I've ran this twice. And have you played it? Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Uh, this adventure is really, really awesome. And uh, I think the best part about this adventure, the things I do like about it, are the fact that it, it adds a really cool campaign setting for anybody that wants to run a game in the Underdark. That is one of my favorite parts about this game is that it has Menzo Baranzan as an entire city. It has ways to travel through the Underdark, encounters in the Underdark, um, has a really great premise at the very beginning, and the phase risk kind of crazy magic that turns people insane is really, really interesting, and it's really, really fun. Um, I think that there's a lot of really great ideas and some cool world building they put into playing a campaign in the Underdark. We've played this a lot more than two times. We've yeah. We've never completed it. Ever. Never completed it. We've started it like probably six times. That's, you know, that actually plays into the cons of this adventure. Yeah, it's really hard to yeah. complete. It's really, really difficult yeah. to c continue playing because to be fair, the story is not that interesting. <laughs> the whole concept of the story is that demons are in the Underdark and they're rising and they're affecting it and making everybody crazy and they're trying to get to the surface like Demogorgon and Frazer Blue and uh, Zugget Moy are like affecting things that are going throughout the um, throughout the, the, the Underdark. And that's pretty interesting but the whole point behind the adventure is that the players are trying to escape um, and uh, they kind of don't escape until the very end and then at the very end they take an army down to go defeat everybody. We've never gotten that far because, hmm. Um, and uh, it has some really neat stuff. It starts off with with a, with a prison escape, and then you have to track how the drow are tracing after the players, and that can be really, really fun. They have a lot of NPCs, though. Yeah, the second. very beginning of this game. It's like nine starts off with, like, nine yeah. or, like, 12 NPCs. Um, it's, like... They're really interesting. They all have, like, secrets, and you, like, get to figure out what their secret is yep. throughout, like... Yep. And then eventually they they either die or they leave, but they're... While all of these NPCs are very cool, the game just goes, Here, Dungeon Master, here's 12 NPCs, run them! And it's like, I can't just talk over the players. I think um, a really good way to run this is either have them all die, or <laughs> have um, have about two of them that you put into the very beginning of the game. So you still get that like NPC feel, but you um, the players uh, aren't being bombarded with NPCs. Combat is ridiculous. Yeah, co combat just becomes so bogged down. Yeah. Not fun at all. Yeah. Um, so Out of the Abyss, really great setting. If you're looking to implement the Underdark into your game, pick this book up 100%. If you are wanting to run an adventure that takes place in the Underdark, this game is not that good when it comes to it, to be honest. So, draw inspiration. Um, draw inspiration from this book. Take shit out of it. Um, I don't recommend running it. So I give this book a, I don't know, a six? Yeah. A fair. six. It's you should, really you should get it. You should read it. Very cool, but not that cool to run. It's like the, the three games. Like, if you can't get past the third game, it's not worth playing. Exactly. This game, we never get past, like, the third or fourth game. It's just like, yeah. meh. So... Curse of Strahd. 10 out of 10. <laughs> Curse of Strahd is really, really great. Um, we love it. Um, we I've ran it about four times. We've completed it once, and we actually completed it live on stream. If you want to go check it out on Arcane Arcade. Uh, you've played in it. You've ran it. Um, we This adventure is really, really, really good. There are parts of it I don't like. Now we'll talk about them. But um, let's, let's just rave about it first. Um, it's just like a gothic horror, vampire, undead kind of adventure. But it somehow manages to include every part of D&D &D in it. It includes, like... Um, uh, wizards and curses and and there's a dragon, um, there's, a dragon. Yeah. there's uh there's holy warriors there's there's a there's a devil like there's dungeon crawls there's exploring adventures there's npcs the players can kind of complete this however they want it ends up being like an open world kind of adventure where they get to kind of complete and defeat strahd on their own terms mm -hmm. yeah. so and you can still give the story like structure using like the the tarot card reading following. yeah the Taraka deck. Taraka deck. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. That's one of my favorite parts. Yeah. At the very beginning, there's this. You can get like a Taraka deck, and you can do a little reading that really gets immersive into the game for the players to like uh, get clues on where magic items are later in the game. So uh, it's it's really really great. This book is dripping with atmosphere and. It's just great. I highly recommend it. Uh, there's a few things I do not like about it. Number one is the Death House. 
Um, the Death House is at the very beginning of this game. It's supposed to be the tutorial adventure uh, for for uh, Curse of Strahd, uh, meaning like you could start your players at level one, they can go through the Death House and get through level three. Sounds neat, right? Don't run it at all. The Death House is the tutorial adventure, the thing I hate all the time. And it is completely optional and really boring and pertains nothing to the rest of Curse of Strahd. It's just a dungeon that they get to run through and it's stupid and I don't get it. Start your players at level three and or five when they run this adventure. Uh, the other thing I don't like is the NPCs they throw at you at the very beginning of this game. Um, uh, at the very beginning of the game, the players are said to start in the village of Barovia, where their first mission is to uh, get Irina and Ismark to uh, to Kretz, to get them a safe place away from Strahd. I won't go into too much detail there. I personally do not like this starting mission whatsoever because the players know nothing about Barovia. Why would they be good to uh, to to venture off and protect them and to get to a place they've never been to before? Um, also, the NPCs don't know them at all, and it's just like, well, we need to get you across the map for some reason, and it's like. Uh, uh, okay, and it just kind of sucks. Um, personally, I highly recommend that you do the opposite. In fact, instead of starting on the east side of the map when you run Curse of Strahd, start at the east, of the the western side, and have the first place they go to be Kretsk. Um, it'll be much more natural. Um, the Kretsk won't let the adventurers in unless they help them, and the one thing they can do to help them is to go down to the Wizards of Wine and go on like the starting mission mm -hmm. of getting wine away from these druids. And they're introduced in the world very well there, and they can use Kretsk as a base of operations as a safe haven, so that when they eventually get to the village of Barovia, they can, of course, get Irene and Ismark and bring them to Kretsk and have more of an involved uh, kind of story there. You can so. also find the, the letters that you are, you're given yep. that are like Strahd's letter, and then there's like an actual note from the Burgomaster yep. in the pathway to Kretsk. Exactly. You can still kind of run all of that, just have them show up at Kretsk the first. Are back there, so. mm -hmm. They have a lot of handouts for this yep. adventure, too. So uh, I would have to give Strahd a. I'm giving it a 9 out of 10. 9 out of 10, definitely. 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10 for you? I All right. Curse of Strahd. Well, if you want to run Curse of Strahd and you want to, you want to play something for, uh, for it's great for new players, it's great for experienced players, highly recommend it. It's a good Halloween game. It's a good Halloween game, too. That's coming up. So, Storm King's Thunder. I've run this once. We got about halfway through it, and then we stopped playing it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and you played in it. I did. And it is not bad, but it's not good either. It does the, the show off thing at the beginning. Too. The very beginning of the adventure go, starts off with you're in a town and it's being attacked by giants. So here everyone have an NPC so that you can defeat the giant. And it's like having to defend a town against giants in a two hour long combat that is just to be like, wow, I guess giants are hard to kill. Yeah, duh. Like, okay, it sets them up as really good villains, but at the same time, um, it's really, really frustrating to start off your adventure like that. Um, and the start of the game can be really cool because all of the starting towns are very fleshed out, mm -hmm. very, very detailed. There's lots of things the players can do. Um, but this book should have just been the Sword Coast campaign setting because the entire adventure pertains to you knowing all about Faerun and the Sword Coast because every location the players go to do not particularly have a map or things to do there except for their side quests. So they're going to be constantly going to like Waterdeep and to maybe Baldur's Gate and to maybe um, Luskin. But while they're there, you don't have anything in this book that pertains to Luskin or that. And they go, go, oh, read more about it in the Sword Coast Adventures Guide. And the DM's like, cool, I guess I'll just have to write a bunch of stuff for this game. When I'm going to run a pre-written adventure, uh, <laughs> I don't want to have to write. The entire point behind this is that I have all of it in the book and I don't want to have to do anything else besides it. Um, I know some people disagree with me on that aspect. That's the allure behind a pre-written adventures. It's pre-written. So what I don't like about Storm Kings is that not a lot of it's written. It's a very interesting story, a very interesting setting that you could put into uh, Faerun, but um, I really wish they kind of just took the Sword Coast Adventures guide and just kind of slammed it into this one, fleshed out a bunch of locations and went, look, a campaign setting for Faerun and an adventure you can run in it. Mm -hmm. That would have been cool, but they didn't do that. I remember being pretty upset because don't you need to go to Cholt to get the stupid ring? No. No? <sighs> Tomb of Annihilation acts as a sequel to this game. Okay. Where uh, the guy who's causing all the problems, yeah. um, Artist Simber, yeah. is he's in, in Cholt. He's in this game. He's mentioned you have to go find him. 
but he's in Chult. Yeah, I remember meeting so him in... So the point is, is that you're, like, supposed to play this game, and then you're supposed to play Tomb of Annihilation, and they're supposed to, like, go hand in hand with each other. Okay. Don't. <laughs> Don't. Just play Tomb. Tomb is just a fun game, and you should just play it. Um, this game this game just so, references other games. To, like... Don't recommend very much. Um, I definitely think it can be fun. You can it definitely make these. It was a fun game. It was but... the, I, yeah, we played it, and yeah. it was fun, but... Yeah. Mm. I, mean, I think we made it fun, though. Yeah, like, definitely. The character we played. I would give this one a four. I'll give it a five. Five? five? It was a fun game. Okay. From what we played. I, I really liked um, killing a, um, a storm giant with um, uh, the uh, mutual suffering blood right. That was pretty yeah, cool, that yeah. That was really fun. That was pretty awesome. Yeah. Tales from the Yawning Portal. Um, this is not really an adventure. It is more um, a book, a collection of old adventures that have been updated to 5th edition besides for Dead and Thay. Dead and Thay is a playtest adventure for 5th edition, actually. It's just a big, giant dungeon. Everything in here is a big, giant dungeon. Um, and I've only run about two of them. Um, White Plume Mountain is in this. It's where you got Black Razor. But this book is really great for, like, Out of the Abyss. If you want to take something out of this and put it in your game, perfect. Yep. I don't recommend running a campaign based in the Yawning Portal where you just go through a bunch of dungeons. Eh, doesn't really sound too interesting. But um, the updated adventures for this are, are very well written. There's a lot of really cool art. And I can't really give this one a bad say about it. If you're gonna run D&D &D and you're brand new, I don't recommend it. Um, it it's, it's cool, but if you're running a homebrew campaign, totally recommend throwing these into your game. They're, mm -hmm. they're very good and they can be very interesting. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say about- If you don't wanna write for like a dungeon, just take it. Yeah, just take it out of this. This is yeah. all, you know, Flavor written by- game maybe, but, yeah. mm. uh, I'll give this one a seven out of 10. You don't know? Five, six. Tomb of Annihilation. Uh, we're about to run this, actually. We're getting close to it. Um, but I've played it once. I've yeah. read a good portion of it, and uh, you played in it did, as well. Yeah. I really like this adventure. I think it is um, not great for brand new players. Um, it is very complicated. It is hard. Mm -hmm. It is difficult. Mm -hmm. But oh my god, this game is really, really cool. It adds a lot of really unique stuff. Just mm -hmm. imagine for me. Imagine for it. Close your eyes. Imagine. Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. Jungle Adventure. Dinosaurs, Yanti, and Liches in D&D. &D. Yeah. That's this adventure. Yeah, it's, it's really fucking yeah. cool. So, um, it's uh, once again, I love the open world games. They're really, really cool. Um, Storm King's Thunder is kind of like an open world game. This game, almost kind of like Storm King's Thunder, there are some locations that you will have to write up on your own if they don't exist in the book, but a lot of them are fleshed out, and they... This game is very creative, very, very creative. Um, I recommend go watching our D&D stories about this one. There's one called Dinosaur Races, and then there's one called um, the Goblin Camp, Camp thing something. Yeah. Um, go check those out because those were a part of this adventure. Um, if you are going to run a game for a bunch of people who have played D&D a lot, highly recommend it. Um, if you're playing for brand new players, don't really recommend it as much. Um, uh, it's just difficult and um, it can be very complicated and they may not be into the idea of everything that this has to offer But this is a very novel idea for people who've played D&D um, already um, So mm -hmm. I give this one an 8 out of 10. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I played an anthropologist. You've played yeah. an anthropologist? You know that's, that's right! A it's a background in this yeah. one, so... Yeah. Oh man. That I, I kind of played it like Indiana Jones. I was like a rogue anthropologist. It was pretty fun. I'm excited to run yeah. this again. Yeah. Very, very excited. So. Uh, Definitely recommend it. And, of course, the fun fact everybody likes to point out, Pendleton Ward was a uh, consultant for uh, this yeah, book who nice. wrote Adventure Time. So a cool guy. Very cool. Waterdeep Dragon Heist. I did an entire review of this book on this channel if you want to go check it out. Um, but I really, really love this game a lot. It is probably my favorite still. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite adventure for 5th edition um, next to Curse of Strahd. Mm -hmm. uh, it is absolutely perfect for brand new players. Yeah. And also great for experienced players. Mm -hmm. There is a it, it, it is a great balance between being really deep, but also being very simple at the same time. It's like the adventures are like, go here and do this thing and save this guy. But if you think about it more, there's more going on here and you can really um, unravel the mystery that this mm -hmm. game has to offer. The, one of the best parts about this game is that there's multiple ways that you can run it, um, and uh, it, can, it can be different every time you do it, and the players get a lot of choice, just like in Curse of Strahd on what they want to do. Um, later on, there's a chapter called Dragon Season, where they go down an encounter chain, and the encounter chain is basically hot potato with the Stone of Galore, <laughs> and the Stone of Galore is like the, the, uh, the, the MacGuffin, basically. And the best part about this is that the players can get it whenever they accomplish it. So if they don't get it at the rooftop chase, 
They may get it when they break into the mausoleum, mm -hmm. but if they don't get it, then they might get it when they uh, when they stealth um, into the docks and steal it from a ship. And if they don't get it, then then it moves over here, and they might get it there. And then if they don't get it at all, then there's an entire different ending to the game that is totally up to the players. And then there's this really cool vault ending where all of the allies they've made it um, throughout the game kind of come in at the end for this big like. Avengers Endgame kind of battle um, between all of the different factions. Um, plus, Waterdeep is just really, really fleshed out. And yeah. Very, very cool. Um, and more. we actually ran this and beat it over on um, on our Can Arcade. If you want to go check that out. And um, I've also run it twice. Ran it twice before. Um, we, I've beat it twice with we different. Ran, um, we ran the summer on Arcane Arcade. Yep. Um, this is my number one recommend to brand new players. Um, it, I, I don't know about you, but in my opinion, it's great. It's also very short. It, you could complete it in about 10 sessions. So um, that's another really great part about this. And it's just really classic with a lot of really brand new great ideas. And it does one of my favorite tropes for D&D, which is mystery. You get to kind of un uncover a mystery. And it very rarely does the whole, here's a bajillion NPCs. They do... It at the very beginning, but it's an option. You don't have to do it, which thank God I don't want to. I think this is the only pre-written to make me cry. Really? This game made me cry. Yeah. yeah. So um, I give this one a ten out of ten. Yeah. You should definitely pick it up, and um, I think it's really for anybody. I think anybody can run this and have a fun time with it. So, uh, mm -hmm. oh, is there anything I don't like about this? I think there is one thing I don't like about this adventure. The the beginning of the game is like structured here, and then it splits off that go into the four different seasons. Um, and the very beginning it doesn't really have a season because they don't know which one you've picked yet. Um, but you can kind of retroactively add it as they're playing it. Like, it's summertime. Yeah. The weird part is that it introduces a bunch of characters throughout the adventure. Not overwhelmingly, but like they'll meet characters that they may never see again because they're not important. They don't pertain to their adventure. So, for example, the very beginning, there are, um, it has to do a lot with the Xanathar Guild. But if you don't run Spring, you'll never see the Xanathar Guild ever again. Yeah. Um, and then there's characters that work for Manchun, and then if they don't, if they aren't doing Winter, then they'll never see them again. Mm -hmm. But they do it as a way to kind of add in the yeah. characters so they can come it, up later. It also is like you don't always see what's going on. Like they're still like in the background. Every one of those characters yes. wants the item, even though it's not their season. Exactly. So yeah. it's really just the way I say it is like yeah. there's one villain who really kind of steps up to the plate and really goes yeah. hard for it. So um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. It's just it's just kind of weird. It's like well, we never saw that guy again, and it's like mm -hmm. yeah, but who cares? Doesn't yeah. matter. So um, really good. Mm -hmm. Ten out of ten. My opinion. Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage. I have ran this once. We played a page. <laughs> did like a one shot basically yeah I don't... uh this book is a gigantic dungeon crawl but i think it's a pretty good dungeon crawl there's a lot of really unique adventures in this that you can have and i'll be honest i have not played too much of it i have read a lot of it um so i can't really give it a fair review on whether or not you should play it it's supposed to be the successor to dragon heist i don't know i don't know if i really recommend going from a city heist mystery game to big gigantic dungeon crawl yeah. um i think this is one of the this is like out of the abyss and tales of the awning portal this book is really great to take ideas out of and put into your homebrew game but not really to run as a full adventure it i i think there's definitely some fun you can have with it but I don't know. It's mm -hmm. just meh. Yeah, we um, didn't play. We played like one game of this. Yeah, we played yeah. like a one shot of it, and it yeah. was okay. Yeah. I think it'd be great if you ran it online on like Roll Twenty or Fantasy Grounds mm -hmm. because it's yeah. a dungeon crawl would be really easy. I actually highly recommend. We did it over on the channel that if you run Waterdeep Dragon Heist, just go into Curse of Strahd right afterwards. You end this game at level end Waterdeep Dragon Heist at level five, and it's that's a perfect starting point for yeah, Curse and then of you Strahd. Don't have to do the. Um... Death House. Yep, you don't have to do yeah. the Death House, and you can start um, into Curse of Strahd, um, and you can take from our recommended stance and go about it that way. So um, I think that's one of the best ways you can run pre-written adventures for 5e. But can't give this one a solid opinion. Um, yeah. I definitely probably just give it like a 5 out of 10. Run Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Maybe, maybe I'll really enjoy running a dungeon crawl and not playing it. Ghost of Saltmarsh. We're in the middle of playing this one right now. Um, we've uh, it's it's newer, so of course we're um, we are about like twenty to twenty five games in, um, and I really like this one. Yeah. But to be honest, I I enjoy Ghost of Saltmarsh a lot. 
Um, not only does it, 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 this book is split up into three parts. It is Salt Marsh. Mm -hmm. Salt Marsh is a great place to frame any campaign setting if you do not want to do the pre-written adventures. It is a fleshed out, perfect little D&D town set in, um, in uh, the Greyhawk setting, which is really, really cool. Um, and uh, there's lots of things that you can do in it, and there's politics and factions. There's even, here's where you buy magic items. Here's where you can do side quests. Here's where you can do all that kind of stuff, and that's a really great part. The second part of this adventure, this game is all the adventures, and the adventures are old adventures, much like Tales from the Awning Portal, that they've updated to 5th edition, which they do a really good job of, in my opinion. I think that they, they sometimes your players will be like, oh, this is an old adventure. I'm like, yeah, this is, this is old shit, and they kind of just don't remember. Or, or remember that that's what the game is about. And the third part of this this book is uh, ship combat rules, which are pretty fun. They're okay. Yeah, we haven't really fought. Yeah. Very much on ships. The only downside to the ship combat stuff is that uh, it can be really fun for like two players in the DM. Um, yeah. Everybody else doesn't really get a role. Like, um, so um, that's why you should go check out uh, Guy Sklander's nautical uh, campaign rules um, that he has over on Kickstarter. Not sponsored, but he's a good friend and I got to play test it, so go check it out. Mm -hmm. um, he added a bunch of really cool rules that were based off of Ghost he's of Solar. He's a boat guy, yeah. He was very upset about the uh, toilets on the ship. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that at Gen yeah. Con, yeah. But another really cool part about um, this book is also the random tables for sea adventures. That is so fucking cool, and I love it so much that you can come up with random islands, yeah. random the adventures. Island yep. Fun. Get on a boat, go out to sea. Here's a ghost ship. There's a fey island. Uh, here's a thing that's going to happen on your ship. Like, there's, there's lots. You can have a lot of fun with this campaign that doesn't just pertain to the adventures, and I... Highly recommend running this for new players, for experienced players, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. This adventure can be very cool, and it is very easy to add your own homebrew stuff into the game. I did it with the stream game. We're streaming it over on, well, we're recording, we're, we are playing the game over on Arcane Arcade if you want to go check it out. Um, uh, we have new episodes every Tuesday, so, uh, but um, I'm enjoying running it a lot, and I think that this is a very good adventure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I would give this, um, I think the only parts I don't like about it are that, uh, the, um, some parts are kind of dungeon crawly, um, and that, that can yeah. be fun for some players, not really okay. a thing for our group, but I, there's a way to make it fun, We're definitely. You're in a dungeon crawl right now. You're in a dungeon crawl right now, but, um, it's not bad. No. Um, and it's, it's give definitely it, very good. Give it a seven. Yep. And it's especially very fun if you have all the Beetle and Grimm stuff for it, which yeah, we do, which so. Yeah, we do. So. Yeah. Um, I'll give this one an eight out of ten. Eight out of seven. Seven? Yeah. yeah. Um, this one? Yep. Ghost Salt Marsh? Pretty dang good. So Dragon of Ice Spire Peak. One I've ran and you haven't. So you know more about this one than I, I do. do. Um, this is the brand new Essentials Kit. Um, basically the brand new starter set yeah. um, that they released and it comes with dice. Dice. And um, not pre-made characters. Not pre-made characters. It comes with like a basic uh, player's handbook type mm -hmm. thing. There's three classes, three races, and then you just give it to whoever you're playing with, let them choose. There might be more than three. three um, from four. what you've been telling me about this, uh, it seems I, very, very I good. I run it for sixth and eighth graders because I work at a school and there were some kids who wanted to play D&D &D and then I found this at Target and I was like, that'll, that'll work. Mm -hmm. And they love it. Um, you've been showing me a lot about it and yes. there's little handouts for everything as well. Handouts, and little, um, Quest cards, initiative tracker, it's really a lot of fun if you have uh, kids you want to play with, maybe your friends want to start really a game. Really good art, too. Yes, there is good art. There's, um, It's really uh, detailed for what it is. Like mm -hmm. um, The NPCs are really fun. Um, like the, the mayor of uh, Fandolin is terrified of the white <laughs> dragon. He will not come out of his house and he slides your payment under the door <laughs> one coin at a time and the kids think it's hilarious. That's great. It's yeah. little characteristics that yes. get added to the game. Yeah. I, um, I, this game, I've, from what I've heard, is very, very simple. Yeah. Um, and are, great for new players. Yeah, there are six quests and you're basically trying to find items and warn people about the dragon and then items to defeat the dragon and then, um, and then the end is like going up to the Ice Fire Peak to yep. defeat him. And you are, you, you're experienced with 5th edition, but I'd say you're more of like a newer Dungeon Master, right? Yes. Is this easy to run? Yeah. yeah. So that's Very what I was about to say. Run. I was going to say like, I think this adventure is perfect for people who are brand new to running D&D. &D. Yeah. If, if you want to have a game that you can run, don't run the starter set. Run this. It's new. Yes. It's fun. It's interesting. And it comes with a lot of stuff to help yeah. you out as a DM. So, um... Uh -huh. Yeah, this this adventure's great. I think All it's the really cool. All monster stats. 
Um, I think all of the monsters are pretty easy to run. Mm -hmm. like, the first thing they fought was a manticore, and they thought it was crazy. They yeah. thought it was the dragon because it has wings. <laughs> um, it's cool. It, just to give you an example of one of the adventures in this game, um, it's it's all about like killing. Uh, they have to like stop a dragon. Yeah. Um, and there's this. They have to go warn people about it. And one of the areas is like these gnomes, yes. and the gnomes, um, uh, their leader is like crazy because he saw. Um, he was attacked by a mimic. He was attacked by a mimic. And yeah. it's like, oh, that's cool. And so they think he's crazy because the mimic can hide and they don't know that. But the best part, it goes, it like doubles down on this like, all right, mimic, you got to stop it. But guess what? You can just befriend the mimic if and you my, want to. My kids did. It, it says, um, don't just like have everyone kill it like um, the monsters, like encourage role playing. And yes. my kids were like, can it, does it talk? And I was like... Yep, it says that some mimics can talk. Like I'll, let, I'll allow it, and they um, they convinced the mimic to leave by giving it a cow to eat instead of the the gnomes. <laughs> I think the writers have come a very long way from yeah. go find a dwarf and kill a bunch of goblins to well, you can go here and there's a mimic and you can convince it to mm -hmm. stop instead of just killing yeah. it. And it's a it, mimic, it's a monster, yeah. but you you can do it whatever you want. It role playing. Yes, it's great. Very good. Yeah. Um, I don't think I can give this one a rating, so you get to, you get to rate um, it. Eight out of ten. Eight out of I ten. I think it's really. Um, I haven't I haven't completed it yet, but all of the quests seem really fun. I think it might be a little, little difficult. Like, um, I don't know though. My kids are kicking butt, so. Cool. Um, Interesting. Um, yeah. Dun dun dun. The last one. Last one, y'all. Baldur's Gate: Descent into Avernus. Um, I'm only sort of salty about this book yep. because my main game on Arcane Arcade is Sunder and Zeriel's the main villain along with a bunch of devils. Yeah. But as I've read this book and we started to run it, it's very different. Yeah. So um, I've grown to really like this. Um, this book is awesome in my opinion. It is has a ton of novel and very interesting ideas of like Mad Max and like the Nine Hells and the Nine Hells have rarely been explored in 5th edition and the fact that they just double down on it here and go really into it and they add a lot of really cool stuff. There's really cool art in this book as well. Ooh, that um, cool. Lots Ooh, of maps. Mm -hmm. by spikes. Yeah, this game oh. is dark as hell. It is really interesting and super cool. All of the parts in the Nine Hells are, are awesome. We just started playing it, so we're barely into it, but I love this adventure a lot. Very, very interesting. I will put it up there with Tomb of Annihilation, though, where, like, not super cool for, like, brand new players. If you have, like, brand new people and you're like, we're going to run Descent to Avernus, it's like, mm. This game will kill you. Yeah, this game will probably kill you. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it gets complicated, and yeah. there's a lot of, like, really dark themes as well. Yes, so, yeah, definitely probably not for kids, but... Um. <laughs> You can always make it PG in some way. Yeah. Look at that thing. Oh. It's dripping blood. Yeah, but a kid would think that that looks funny. And yeah. But I love how dark this game gets. I am always a fan for like the darker, more morally gray games. Um, and this game is really, 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 really cool. Yeah. Um, and it's very interesting. Um, I have bone to pick with this game. The beginning of it sucks. We, we started it off and the game as uh, unfortunately does not suffer from the, here's the bajillion NPCs at the very beginning of the game. It does not suffer from, whoa, look at this big epic thing that's happening. Zeriel doesn't swoop down in the first episode and go, I'm more powerful than you, and disappears. Instead, it suffers from the tutorial level. Um, it has this weird bathhouse, bathhouse Kill the Cult of the Dead 3 dungeon crawl at the very beginning of this game. It's interesting, but it's like super complicated. It and does have to do with the rest of the game. Yeah, it is sort of reminiscent of Waterdeep Dragon Heist, but Waterdeep Dragon Heist's beginning dungeon crawl is very, very, very short. It's just like you go to two rooms and it's done. Mm -hmm. But this one, it's long and the players may not know what they're really trying to do. And there's a lot of things at work while they're in the dungeon. And it's just kind of eh. Personally, I would start... <laughs> This sucks. This actually kind of sucks. I would start this adventure off in, it, maybe not even in Baldur's Gate. I would legitimately start it in Candlekeep and just be like, boop, and you go to the Nine Hells. Because everything I've read beyond that, we haven't got there yet, um, has been really awesome. And there's a stark difference between like the beginning of the game in Baldur's Gate, where the game is supposed to take place, and the rest of the game. So, weirdly, this game is kind of like Ghost of Saltmarsh split into two bits. A campaign, a campaign setting for Baldur's Gate and Avernus, and 
a really cool story that involves itself in Avernus. The story bits in Baldur's Gate are just meh. It's kind of cool. Um, I don't really recommend it. I'd say just start at level five and go into Candlekeep and you'll get into the really cool parts of this game. Um, if you really want to run the awesome bits, otherwise it's going to take forever to get to the other bits of it. So um, I would give this adventure a eight out of 10. I'm just, I just love devils too. And uh, there's Ariel. She's my queen. Yeah. I don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. What do you give this one? Six out of ten. I think um, it still needs to get to a point where it's like cool. Like yep. it, there's like oh yeah, that's neat. I like these items that have come up so far, but it's we're not in hell yet. I feel like when we get to hell, it'll be a little bit better. Cool. Um, so that's all the fifth edition pre-written adventures. Do like a top top three. Top three. You want to like order them best, like best least to worst. worst. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, it's not all of them, I know, but uh, yeah, let's yeah, let's order them from least to worst. So uh, let's get them all. Let's get them from all out here. From least to worst. From <laughs> <laughs> from best to worst. Uh, what's the worst one? Um, Horde of the Dragon Queen. Yeah. Storm King's Thunder next. Oh. Okay. Personally, what were you gonna put? Tales of the Yawning Portal. Heck no. That game's good. It's got some good adventures in it. And then I would probably do, um, after that, I'd probably, do, yeah, Tales of the Iron Portal next. Mad Mage. Then maybe, uh, no, I'd do the starter set. Oh, yeah. Then Dungeon of the Mad Mage, cause, just because I don't know that much about it. Yeah. Um, then Out of the Abyss. Tomb. Then I would do Tomb. Descent. Ghost of Saltmarsh. No, oh, yeah, I would probably. I would. Would you put Ice Spire Peak on top of Descent? Yes. Ooh, how controversial. Ghost of Saltmarsh after that, and then. Oh boy. Waterdeep. And then no, it's Curse of it's no, Curse of Strahd. It's on. Curse of Strahd. Waterdeep no. goes on top. Curse of Strahd goes God, on top. Spencer. No. It Put, you put Curse of Strahd right here! No. You put 